Okay, all right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the PetroTeach webinar on application of artificial lift and machine learning in petroleum engineering. I am Hassan Karimai, represent PetroTeach today and act as the moderator in this webinar. As you already heard from the organizer, you are entering as listening only mode and muted. Before we proceed the event, let us check if you receive the voice properly. There is a window in front of your platform and by clicking on the arrow, you will see the full window version with the chat box. Please type the word hi or hello or something so that we make sure we have established the full communication. Yes. Seems everything is okay. So the outline of today's webinar begins with a brief introduction to PetroTeach, and then we introduce our distinguished instructor, Professor Shahab Muhattaq. Next, we follow and listen to the webinar lecture, which lasts 45 to 60 minutes. And finally, we will have Q&A session for approximately 10 to 15 minutes. PetroTeach is a global provider of high quality training solutions to the oil and gas industry. We are providing at the moment about 150 training course by up to 50 distinguished instructors with high track record from academia and industry. Our training styles include online, public and in-house courses. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, PetroTeach is mainly focused on the distance learning and for more information, please visit our website, www.petro-teach.com and download our course catalog for 2021. You may also follow us in social media like LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook. And also please do not forget to subscribe our YouTube channel to watch the related videos and receive future videos. The event today is part of the webinar series that PetroTeach is offering during this year. For September, we started with Nightmare of Gas Hydrate Blockage by Professor Tohidi, and we had totally six interesting webinars. Also in October, we started by Casing and Cementing by Jerry Rusnak, followed by Professor Azin, who talked about classic measurement versus image processing in porous media, and also advanced analysis of carbonate systems by Professor Maria Muti. And our last speaker in October was Dr. Mazda Irani, who talked about SAGDI and solvent SAGDI. In November, we started by Imene Ferhat, who talked about borehole image applications. And today, Professor Shahab Muhattaq will talk about petroleum data analytics, then David Garner will give a webinar about application of machine learning in geomodeling on Monday night. Well Integrity Management by Fayez Makkar will be the next talk on 18th PNA of the Wells by Mahmoud Khalifa on 25th. And finally, Capitality in Porous Media by Professor Majid Hassanizadeh on Monday 13th. And also in December, we'll have four webinars, as you can see. So please send email to webinar at petro-teach.com and you will receive an automatic reply contains a list of the webinars and proper links for registration. So we are very pleased that Professor Shahab Muhaqar can join us today. The topic of his presentation, as mentioned before, is application of artificial lift and machine learning in petroleum engineering. Today, we will receive latest updates on the petroleum data analytics and important considerations on this subject by Shahab. Materials will be covered in the ongoing webinar and will be used in the upcoming course is related to the Professor Muhaqib valuable experience and comprehensive research on the topic. As you can see, Shahab has more than 30 years of R&D experience in application of AI and ML in petroleum engineering. 
He is petroleum engineering professor at West Virginia University and has written three books on the application of this technology in our industry. He is SPE distinguished lecturer from 2007 and uh, 2020, 2020 and also distinguished author 2004 and 2005. So let's move to the presentation. I wanted to remind you all that you can post your questions using the same chat box introduced at the beginning. And at the Q&A session after the lecture, some of them will be answered. So I'm going to hand over the talk to Shahab to address her presentation. Yes. Here you are, Shahab. Thank you very much. I should be able to show my screen now. Please let me know if you can see it. Uh, I've shared my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes oh. you can see. Very well. So I'll go ahead and... Uh, yes. May I get started? Yes. Okay. okay. Yes. Very yes. good. <clears throat> well, good afternoon uh, to you all in uh, Northern Europe. I'm still in the morning here in the US. Uh, the topic, as was mentioned, is petroleum data analytics, which is the application of artificial intelligence and machine learning in uh, petroleum engineering. Uh, the topics that I'm going to cover uh, is I'm going to start with some definitions of uh, what AI and machine learning is and what petroleum data analytics is. And uh, as I go into the detail of petroleum data analytics, I will cover four very, very specific items, which, uh, in my opinion, based on the experience that I have had, uh, especially what's happening today in our industry when it comes to this technology is very, very important to uh, understand these four major characteristics of uh, petroleum data analytics. First one is uh, how do you model physics using AI and machine learning? Uh, next, I will talk about uh, the engineering application of this technology, AI and machine learning. <clears throat> As you all are <coughs> exposed to this technology, uh, on your regular uh, uh, life. Uh, it has to do with Google, it has to do with Netflix and Facebook and so forth. Are these engineering application of AI and machine learning? The answer is no. So what is the difference between using this technology to try to solve engineering related problem versus non-engineering related problem? This will be another topic that I will talk about. Another topic that uh, I find it, I learned actually, uh, that it has become very quite interesting is because a lot of people, specifically in our industry and in other engineering area, they, they, they think AI and machine learning is the same as statistics. Well, I'm going to discuss that to see what the difference is between these two technologies. And finally, I will be talking about one of the most important issues that has uh, been brought up uh, specifically started by the uh, US Department of Defense uh, uh, only a few years ago. It's called explainable AI, explainable artificial intelligence. Uh, this seems to me is going to be a very important item and that's going to be uh, discussed in our industry for, for years to come and it has to do with the fact that now this technology is being uh, applied to engineering related problems. And when it comes to scientists and engineers, they like to have explanation, not black boxes. We'll discuss that. The last item, which I do not think there will be enough time for me to discuss it, maybe we'll do it at some other time, is the realistic contribution of this technology in our industry in terms of <clears throat> uh, actual case studies. So let's get started with uh, petroleum data analytics. Uh, 
It is defined as the application of artificial intelligence and machine learning in our industry. <clears throat> and its main characteristics is that it uses data, PDA, Big Data Analytics, as the starting point, as the foundation, and as the main building blocks of analysis, workflows, modeling, and decision making. Everything that we do, we've been doing for uh, decades, more than 70 years in our industry. Uh, now, PDA brings it to do the same thing, but using a different technology and a different approach of doing it. One more item that's very, very important uh, that we'll be talking about that a lot, that the data that PDA uses, petroleum data analytics, is hard data. Uh, it uses the hard data to reach conclusions. What do I mean by hard data? Well, hard. the reason we call it hard data is because a lot of people use soft data to perform data-driven analytics. And the question is, are they the same? And what is hard data? What is soft data? We'll be discussing that as well. Uh, what hard data does, what petroleum data analytics do using hard data, that's the main definition of it. It, it avoids assumption, it avoids simplifications, it avoids biases, and it avoids preconceived notion. And hard data, in the context of what we will be discussing in petroleum data analytics is measured data, field measurements, not calculated items. Because when we talk about petroleum engineering, we talk about fluid flow in porous media moving, coming to the surface. And uh, the actual field measurements that are done throughout uh, the history of a field or an asset are things such as the placement and the trajectory of the well, <clears throat> any calculation, or any measurement of the geology, excuse me, any measurement of reservoir characteristics, which is well logs, core analysis, scan, any type of well tests that are done in terms of measurement of it. Uh, the design and implementation of completion uh, the seismic, all operational conditions, and well productivity. So, the physical phenomenon that we try to model, we collect all the measured data from it, we move that toward a machine learning algorithm, and we build using these measured data the facts, the reality no interpretation, no assumption. Uh, we built a data-driven model. This is a process that goes on back and forth. It takes some time before you successfully can do it. It's not a simple, straightforward process. Uh, it requires a lot of experience. It li uh, just like uh, any other thing that you do. You, uh, I'm a reservoir engineer. <coughs> For those of you who are engineers, reservoir engineer production drilling uh, in our industry, uh, what you have, you you were not a complete expert in the technology when you got your master's degree or your BS degree or even your PhD degree. Yes, you were exposed to a lot of uh, technology, but as you started working and uh, you got exposed to reality and uh, you generated, developed knowledge beyond academic approach, uh, then you became an expert. Uh, the difference between somebody who has two years of experience and somebody has 10 years of experience, it is quite clear in our industry. The same is true in every other uh, technology. And that is why it is important to uh, do a lot of work in this context in order to get exposed to its reality rather than otherwise. So petroleum data and, and analytics 
includes two parts. One is called data analytics, the other one's called big data analytics. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. Big data analytics is when you use real-time data and it's literally terabytes of data to build models and optimize it and then do decision making. <clears throat> data analytics has to do with the data that is not in terabytes. It's still a good amount of data, but it is the existing data from an asset that you are trying to uh, work with. Uh, it's different from building new uh, tools in order to generate new data in order to build a model. That could be big data analytics. However, the question is with the existing data in an asset, uh, in a mature field that you have, can you build, <clears throat> excuse me, can you use uh, this technology to build <clears throat> models, to perform analysis, do optimization and decision making? The answer is yes, you can. We do have enough data in most of our mature fields. So that is data analytics. And why do I say that? It's because there is a difference. It's when you get exposed to this technology, you learn that there is a difference between big data analytics and data analytics because as the amount of data that you're exposed to increases to a certain extent, uh, then the type of approach you need to use in artificial intelligence and machine learning becomes a bit different. Or I should say it the other way around, since all the uh, what you're exposed to in Google and in other uh, uh, current technologies that are out there, the amount of data that they deal with is incredibly large. So when they generate TensorFlow, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> or other people who will use Python, like Scikit-Learn or other libraries, uh, this is mainly has to do a lot with the big data. Can you use these same uh, tools to do uh, data analytics when you don't have that much data? The answer is yes, you can. However, it is important not to use it exactly as how it was exposed to you. And when you do some examples and comparison, you'll, you'll see what I mean by the difference. And we can go into the detail and talk about that. <clears throat> So petroleum data analytics, which is the application of AI and machine learning, as I mentioned, goes in two categories, data analytics and big data analytics. When you go to big data analytics, literally you're talking about reservoir engineering and completion engineering. When we can't talk about big data analytics. We're talking about uh, production engineering and drilling engineering. And when you go to formation evaluation, that could be somewhere in the middle, depending on how much data you're exposed to. Let me give you an example of data analytics, which is, has to do with reservoir and completion engineering. Uh, you need data such as historical production, historical injection, operational constraint, uh, core analysis, well test, completion design, hydraulic fracturing, workovers, but it goes to big data analytics. We have uh, measurement while drilling, log while drilling, DAS and you know, fiber optics, SCADA, <coughs> ESP, seismic attributes. There is a real time uh, pressure and temperature and production. So you have incredible amount of data there. Uh, obviously, this technology can be used in both situations. But if you think it's going to be exactly the same, then uh, you'll find out that that's not the case. When it comes to formation evaluation, it depends how many well logs you have. In some cases, you have so much well logs that it really makes the big data analytics. In some other cases, you don't have enough, but you still can use it. And another example of it would be artificial lift, ESP and so forth, and gas lift. Again, that depends on how much data you have uh, in order to use it as big data or data analytics. <clears throat> when it comes to engineering application of this technology, AI and machine learning, there are two parts to it. First is purely data-driven modeling. Uh, this is what I was referring to as measurement data that I'm uh, talking about here is uh, the hard data, purely measured data, facts. This uh, requires making sure that the physics 
that you're trying to model using data is honored. And explainable AI, which I will cover here today, <coughs> excuse me, that provides you with, uh, uh, you, you can make sure whether the physics that you're trying to model uh, is honored or not. Also, you require engineering expertise. In other words, in order to be able to do that, if you are a petroleum engineer, it is obvious that you definitely, uh, if, you, if you're trying to solve petroleum engineering related problem, it is obvious that you must be a petroleum engineer. If the problem that you're trying to solve is reservoir engineering, then you have to have reservoir engineering expertise, drilling, production, and so forth, uh, depending on the problem that you're trying to solve. At the same time, you have to develop an expertise in uh, application of AI and machine learning. Uh, and that comes with a lot of uh, uh, practices that you have to do. And it has to honor physics. It has to validate the physics. And one of the things that we do in order to do that, it's called intelligent agents. Again, we'll talk about that. Now, there is another application of this technology, which is equ equation-based data driven what does that mean that means the data that you use for this part is not coming from field measurements it's not coming from facts it comes from the equations that we have generated uh, to build the models we call that smart proxy it's a completely different approach and what it does it uses the equations are used to generate model. If you solve the equation analytically, uh, you, you generate the data from that. Uh, well, testing is a good example. A lot of other uh, uh, examples that we have, uh, Darcy's law and so forth. And the other one is numerical solution. When the, com when the equations that you're trying to solve is too complex to solve analytically and it's solved numerically, then the data that you generate is coming from a numerical uh, simulation. Nevertheless, it is the data that comes from equations. And equations, as we will talk about, is very different from uh, uh, the way pure uh, fact-based data works. But, but nevertheless, what we call a smart proxy, for example, if you build a numerical reservoir simulation, you can generate incredible amount of data. And the physics that you define, or the, the reservoir that you define, you know everything there is about that uh, reservoir because you built it. And you can generate all the data that you want. And then if you use AI and machine learning to build a model using that data, that's called smart proxy. These are two completely different things. And it's a very, very bad idea to combine them. And we can go into a lot of detail uh, why it's a bad idea. They call it hybrid modeling when they combine real data with equations. Uh, when they do that, usually if the people who do that are experts in AI and machine learning and a statistician, and they're trying to solve an engineering problem, when, when AI experts do that, that means they do not have a good understanding of engineering. That's why they use these equations to generate the data for it to work. And if you have engineers who use these hybrid models, that means that they don't know much about AI and machine learning. Why? Because probably they used actual data and they were unable to build a model or explain it or do anything good about it. Uh, therefore, they use an equation to generate data, bring that data, combine it with uh, the real measurements, and then they build the <coughs> model. That's a very bad idea because the whole idea behind AI and machine learning is to avoid assumption, is to avoid biases and preconceived notions and simplification. And when you generate the data from equations, you're bringing in data that includes assumptions and preconceived notions and biases and so forth. And combining them, literally, uh, it's, a, it's a waste. And of course, there are people who uh, do that purely based on, a, they, they know that it's not a good idea, but uh, they do it through a marketing uh, ploy because today, AI and machine learning is very sexy, and if you want to make money as a startup company, you say, I do AI and machine learning. And if you don't know how to do it, then you use equation to generate the data. So that said, uh, it is very important. One more item that I want to mention to you 
imagine if a company come and tell you that we can generate master reservoir engineers in just one month. Nobody says that, obviously, because it makes absolutely no sense. Uh, I just made this up. What if they say we can make a master geoscientist in just one month? Well, this is not real. No company has ever done such marketing because if they do that, nobody will ever talk to them because uh, they know they're not, they cannot be serious. It's a joke. And if they tell you we can generate a master production engineer in one month, do you believe them? No. I just made this up. Why did I make this up? Does it? I wanted to ask you, does it make sense to you if somebody tell you that since you are reservoir engineer, geoscientist and uh, production engineer? So what if people tell you that, that we can make a master data science in just one month? This is real. This is, you see it in uh, the websites, and I don't tell you which company it is, but that tells you the differences. It's an advertisement. And uh, uh, it's a marketing, ad it's a real marketing advertisement. And that's why I'm having this lecture, because if you're interested in this technology, it is very important for you to generate a realistic uh, understanding of this technology rather than just to concentrate on uh, marketing. So let's, the application, what I have been exposed to and what I have done, uh, applied this to drilling, uh, coming up with real time stock pipe prediction, real time grade of penetration optimization in reservoir characterization. We've done it to virtual measurement of permeability, generating synthetic well logs. In reservoir engineering, we have done top-down modeling, which is purely field measurement based data-driven reservoir modeling. And we came up with smart proxy, which if you have a numerical reservoir simulation already, uh, because if you have a green field, you don't have the, uh, enough data for a mature field, you do. But if you do have a numerical reservoir simulation and it takes you hours and hours uh, to run it on HPC for a single run, you can use smart proxy that, again, uses all the data and uh, generates everything literally in minutes with very, very high accuracy when you compare it to a reservoir simulator. Then there's unconventional resources, shale analytics and dynamic shale analytics. I don't want to go into the detail of that, but we, we can talk about it if there are interests. And then production engineering, which is gas lift optimization, real-time ESP failure production. These predictions, this is what I have done, is I have a personal experience on through the past 30 years. So let's talk about, uh, now that we have an idea what PDA is, let's talk about AI and machine learning. Let's define them. What is AI and machine learning? The definition of AI is it's a technology that mimics human brain. It mimics human brain in order to perform analysis, build models, and to do decision making. <clears throat> what is machine learning? Machine learning is using an open computer algorithm to learn from data. The key is it's an open computer algorithm. That means the same algorithm, it's open algorithm. The same algorithm can go to multiple different types of uh, problem that is to be solved. And the same open algorithm can be used. What separates it, what's different is the data that you use. If the data is reservoir engineering, then an open computer algorithm does reservoir engineering model. Modeling. If your data is drilling, then your open computer algorithm performs drilling analysis. <clears throat> it's different with what we do uh, uh, traditionally, which is when we build a numerical reservoir simulator, for example, we tell it explicitly and exactly what to do. The only thing that has to do with the computer is that it does it very fast, but you can do it by hand yourself, correct? So it is the the non-machine learning algorithm, the traditional way of building computer uh, uh, programs is when you go in incredible amount of detail and you tell the computer algorithm exactly what to do and it does it, it does it very fast. So it's all about you and how you make the program. <clears throat> in machine learning, which is an open algorithm, the same algorithm can be used. It's about the data, what kind of data you provide and it can learn from it and build the model. The other one is deep learning. Deep learning, uh, it's learning from the data through pattern recognition, 
using artificial neural network. So with this uh, uh, definitions, let's go a bit more detail about artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence mimics nature uh, to solve complex and dynamics problem. I'm going to show you three different technologies that are specifically use artificial intelligence. It's a uh, umbrella. It covers a lot of things. <clears throat> I'm going to only show you three of the technologies that actually we have been using uh, uh, for the past 30 years in, a, in the context of AI. So a uh, human brain is constructed by evolution to deal with uncertainties and various possibilities. And one of the technologies in the context of AI is neural networks, <clears throat> artificial neural network that mimics the neurons in human brain in order to do the learning process. It's a machine learning. It, it uses uh, what we have, what neuroscientists have understood about neurons, and then computer scientists try to build a model that mimics that process. Learning through pattern recognition by using data to train a series of open a computer algorithm. That is a very short and simple definition of neural network. Of course, we can go into a lot more detail in different contexts. Another technology that uses in this uh, uh, AI, my machine learning, is uh, fuzzy set theory. Uh, the fuzzy set theory mimics not the neurons in human brain, but the human logic. Uh, fuzzy logic avoids the limitations of two-valued Aristotelian logic. Uh, the Aristotelian logic is to, has two binary. It's yes, no, black, white, zero, uh, one, off, and on, right? Human brain does not use that logic to make decisions. Fuzzy logic tries to avoid these limitations that are associated with two-valued logic in order to expand the potential to learn and make reasonable decisions based on non-exact, vague information that we are always uh, exposed to. So uh, these are two different approaches. Uh, one is the human logic, mimicking human logic. The other one, as I mentioned, was human uh, brain. The third algorithm that we use is called genetic algorithm. It, this is a optimization uh, tool. Uh, it mimics Darwinian evolution theory uh, for optimization purposes. Uh, genetic algorithm is part of what's called evolutionary computing, and it's a process that finds solutions uh, and performs optimizations uh, of very, very complex problems through natural selection, which is a Darwinian evolution theory. And uh, so those uh, tell you what are the definitions that in AI and machine learning that we have been using for the past uh, 30 years. So let's uh, now let's talk about uh, modeling physics using AI and machine learning. Is it possible to model physics using AI and machine learning? First of all, what does physics mean? Uh, physics uh, is derived from the Greek word physis, uh, which means nature. So physics has to do with nature. So modeling physics instead uh, intends to describe the features and behavior of physical system using mathematical equation. That's what have we been doing uh, traditionally, right? Any physical phenomena is governed by certain physical principles along with the properties of the material with which the physical phenomena may interact. So that's how we traditionally uh, have used uh, mathematics in order to model the physics. The traditional modeling of physical phenomena includes two things. First, identification of all the variables and parameters that are involved uh, in, in the process that, that describe the feature control the behavior of the physical phenomenon that you want. So once you identify all the variables, the next step you develop mathematical equation that defines the interaction and communication and relationship between all the involved variables. That traditionally is how we have uh, modeled physics uh, as engineers and as scientists. 
<clears throat> and the mathematical equation that we come up with uh, sometimes it's very very complex and uh, cannot be solved easily and when, when it is not that complex you get analytical solution when it's very very complex you get numerical solution so traditional modeling of physical phenomena i give you an example let's think about uh, uh, throwing something at, at, at someone or um, a good example of it would be uh, ballistic missiles for example <clears throat> So the parameters that are involved in this, based on what I just mentioned, are initial velocity, the angle at which it was it is uh, thrown, and uh, the gravity, and you can find the range. So once you identify the variables, you put them together, and you come up with an equation, and you can solve that equation actually quite simply, and it's an analytical solution, right? So that is traditional modeling of physical phenomena. So I have a question for you. First and foremost, can human brain solve physics-based problem? That's a good example. If you're familiar with uh, American football, right? That happens all the time. Uh, the quarterback throws the ball and uh, <coughs> the receiver runs, identifies where the range is and catches it. Uh, so obviously human brain can. Uh, solve problems that are physics-based. However, the question is, does human brain construct and solve mathematical equation? As I just showed you, right, you can see it right here. Does your brain, when, when, when that receiver tries to catch that ball, does his brain build that equation and then it solves that equation, identifies the initial velocity and the angle and does that do that? That does human brain construct and solve mathematical equation in order to solve physics-based problem? I think the answer is quite obvious. That's not the case. So, if that's the case, then how does human brain solve physics-based equation and problems? We do that through observation. We do that through learning. We through that toward, through trial and error. Literally, we do that through data. Uh, so you can see uh, this person is balancing that stick. Is that an easy thing to do? That's another engineering related problem. Uh, does data used by another question that always comes up when we solve reservoir engineering? Uh, first question that I present top down modeling, which is data purely data driven reservoir modeling. When once people, one that people very ask very quickly is does human brain does it says that the data that we have a lot of uncertainty associated with the data that we generate or we measure isn't that the case of course that's the case so the question is data that is used by human brain is it exact no it's uncertain it's full of noise and since ai and machine learning mimics human brain the question is, can it use data to solve the problem? The answer is yes. And even when the data is uncertain and noisy because we are using what how human brain solve problem, then it would be easy to, to do it. So can physics be modeled by data using AI and machine learning? The answer is yes. So how can you prove that? One way of proving that, let's build a model, right? Uh, using equations. Uh, of a very, very highly complex physics. We can take numerical reservoir simulation to do that. Then you solve it numerically or analytically and you generate a lot of data. Then, using this generated data that I just mentioned, the question is, can you use that data to model the physics that generated that data? doing that by AI and machine learning and the answer is yes you can we call a smart proxy but once you do that then you validate the AI model that you have developed of the highly complex physics with completely new data with the simulation run that you never used to build the smart proxy completely brand new uh, uh, simulation runs 
once you do that, you call it blind validation. Then this process confirms that highly complex physical phenomena can be modeled using data uh, and AI and machine learning. So once proven that physics can be modeled by AI and machine learning using data, what does that mean? Well, it means that AI-based model of physical phenomena can be developed using real measured data, as long as you have the data. And as long as you know how AI and machine learning works, the answer is yes, you should be able to do that. There are examples and a lot of uh, case studies that I can show it to you. This would serve as an alternative to traditional modeling of physical phenomena. So it provides a complementation and you can do what traditionally you've been doing, but this is a new approach. It's looking at the same problem from a completely different angle. That is what uh, is unique about it. Data-driven modeling of physical phenomena using AI and machine learning, the key issue behind it, it includes no assumption, it includes no simplification, it includes no preconceived notion, it includes no biases. That is the key. If you include any of these to the model that you're building, that's really you're not using uh, what AI and machine learning can provide it to you. <clears throat> so now let's talk about engineering application of AI and machine learning. There are differences between engineering problem and non-engineering problem. I will give you examples in a minute so you can see it. Solving non-engineering problem requires general intelligence. Solving non-engineering problem does not require any domain expertise. Example of it, I'll give you in a second. How about engineering problem? They do require domain expertise. I'm not talking about AI and machine learning. Very, very general, right? So that's why you go, if you want to be an engineer, you go to university and you get a BS, you get an MS, you get a, why do you do that? why anybody else can solve the same problem? Well, because solving engineering problem requires domain expertise in the reality. Okay. Now let's talk about AI. So one of the first things that uh, was generated at early 2000 by Google was image recognition, convolutional neural network is called. It can tell you the difference between cats and dogs. You take all the equation, all the, uh, pictures and images say, can you say which ones are cat, which ones are dog? And it's an amazing technology. Don't get me wrong at all. It is not simple. It took a lot of uh, uh, experience and uh, uh, capabilities of science and technology to be able to do that, but they did, did it. Question, do you need a domain expertise to tell the difference between cat and dog? A five-year-old can does that, can do that, can it? Another very, very important technology is face recognition. If you have an iPhone, you just look at that and it, it knows it's you, right? Or they're used in, in airports. It's a very interesting technology. It's not easy to do, don't get me wrong. Again, it is very, it, it's a very complex technology. However, what is it that it's uh, doing? What it does uses general intelligence. A five-year-old can tell the difference between the mom and dad, brother and sister. How about object recognition? It's a very, very important technology that has been developed by AI and machine learning. It can tell the difference between a car, a bike, a pedestrian, a child, and a big one, big guy. Very, very important, not easy to do. Don't get me wrong. But the question that I'm asking is, do you need a PhD to find out which one is a car, which one is a truck, which one is a child, which one is a bike? No, you need general intelligence. Voice recognition, telling the difference between <clears throat> uh, whether your mom is calling you or dad is calling you, you need to be only a few years old. These are general intelligence, autonomous vehicles, even driving a car. You don't need a bachelor's degree to drive a car. You don't even need a high school diploma. If you can't write 
or you can't read, can you still drive a car? The answer is yes, you can. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying these are easy to do with AI. It's, that's not at all what I'm saying. But I'm saying the problem you're trying to solve is different. Translation between different languages, you, a child can do that. LSTM, the Catherine generation, what do you see here? Well, don't you think a child can tell that a bird is flying over the water? So you don't need domain expertise, but you need LSTM. You need a very complex process that AI can generate that. I'm not saying the problem solving is easy. I'm saying there are two different types of problems. Now let me give you another example. What do you see here? You see black dots and you see yellow dots, correct? If I take a five-year-old and ask them, can you draw a line and separate these from one another? Don't you think a simple child can do that? There is no requirement of any domain expertise, right? But once they do that, then you can tell them, hey, uh, my dear, this is a nonlinear separation because it's a circle, right? I would like you to do a linear separation. Can you use a straight line or can you use a straight anything, uh, maybe straight plane to separate those? Do you think a child can do that without knowing anything about mathematics? answer is no. You need to know some mathematics, then you can do that. So domain expertise is required to solve some problems where in general intelligence in a lot of other problems you don't need to. So balancing a stick, as I showed you, on a palm of your hand or your finger, a human brain can does that. An engineering approach can do it too. But do we build that engineering uh, equations? We don't. Human brain solved it in a different fashion. Does human brain build equation and then solve it to find solution? The answer is no. Then how does human brain learn? It does it through our neurons. Our neurons include three categories of dendrites, cell body, and axon. The dendrites receive information, receive electrochemical signals, they will come in through the dendrites and they go into the cell body, they sum there and if, if it's above for any given particular cell that threshold different, but if it's below a threshold, nothing's going to happen. If it goes above the threshold, then the cell body generates a new series of electrochemical signals and it sends it through its axon and the axon, <clears throat> which is only one axon per cell, but hundreds and thousands of dendrites that's coming in, that axon that uh, gets that the same electrochemical pulses, that axon, every axon of every neuron is connected to hundreds and thousands of other neurons, dendrites of other neurons. So the axons are, of one neuron is connected to dendrites of hundreds and thousands of other neurons. Therefore, the output of this axon become input to hundreds and thousands of other. This process that human brain uses to work, it goes through inputs that it gets through observation, through experience, and through trial and error. That's how it solves the problem. Solving engineering related problem using AI and machine learning is when you use, when you mimic this human uh, brain when it solves engineering related problems. Uh, so when using AI, AI to solve a specific engineering related problems, how important is the role of domain expertise, expertise in application of AI and machine learning and fundamentals? So engineering application of AI and machine learning requires to a very large extent domain expertise. Then it requires understanding of AI and machine learning and become a good practitioner of that technology. If you don't combine these two, then you will be surprised. So it's 11.51. I think only I have 10 minutes. Uh, should I uh, continue? How long should I go before I get stopped? I should stop. It's up to you, Shahab. Okay, so I'm going to go another eight minutes. I, I, unfortunately, I, I haven't been able to. I'm going to go at least these two parts of it. I'm going to go far more quicker. Uh, okay, please answer any questions. I'll try to stop at the 
end of the hour. So what is the difference between traditional statistics and AI and machine learning? Traditional statistics uses a model to characterize a pattern in the data. It matches predetermined patterns to the data deductively following an Aristotelian approach to the truth. How about AI and machine learning? AI and machine learning uses the pattern of the data to build a model. It doesn't start, when you say linear regression, what does that mean? That means you've already made a decision that the pattern is linear, and then you try to fit it. That's a statistics. When you say nonlinear regression, but it's uh, exponential, so you already made the decision exponential. Even if you use tens and thousands of different hypotheses of different curves that already have a, have a pattern, and you're trying to match it. What you're doing, you, you, you're matching a, a, a predetermined pattern with the data that you have. In AI and machine learning, you don't do that. You, you, the data tells you the pattern. You do not match the pattern to the data that exists. So using pattern in the data to build a model is AI and machine learning. Discovering the pattern in the data inductively, and I explain the differences, following a platonic approach to the truth. So in deductive reasoning, in statistical analysis, you start with the theory, you confirm the hypothesis, then you arrive to a conclusion. In inductive reasoning, which is AI and machine learning, you start with the data. You, you infer conclusion from the data and you arrive at a conclusion or a conjecture, actually, which is a conclusion that they form based on incomplete information. In other words, in deductive reasoning, in the statistical analysis, you start with general principle and you try to go to special cases. In inductive reasoning, which is AI and machine learning, you start with special cases and you try to go to general uh, principle. That is the main difference between these two technologies. Uh, I'm not, this is, uh, I, 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 I'm going to stop there simply because uh, uh, it's going to take a lot more uh, explanation that that statistics is fitting data to predetermined equation machine learning is discovering uh, patterns so in other words that is why that that uh, data science uh, application when it comes to application of engineering data science there is a big difference between statistics and machine learning it is important for you to know statistics don't get me wrong but it is very very wrong to use the same terminology and say oh linear regression is machine learning no, linear regression or statistics been around for more than a century. This one just started in 1986. So one last, I'm going to just show you one more thing that's called explainable AI. So uh, this is this is an important thing, and it has to be, so explainable AI is one of the critical advantages of petroleum data analytic as compared with non-engineering application of AI. It develops data-driven model that cannot be if the developed model cannot be explained, it's called a black box, then it is not petroleum data analytics. There is a difference between correlation and causation. And uh, the engineers and scientists usually mention that correlation does not uh, necessarily explain causation. Are they correct? Absolutely they are, yes. Correlation is not the same as causation. Let me give you an example. What do you see here? You see two curves that are correlating 99.2%. One of them is U.S. spending on science and technology. The other one is suicide by hanging, strangulation, and suffocation. Is one causing the other one while their correlation is so high? Is another example. When is discover, uh, divorce in the state of Maine, is that causing the cap per capita <clears throat> consumption of margarine? Obviously not, but look. In the past, in 10 years, they have a 99.3. So co correlation and causation are very, very different. Uh, our traditional models of uh, physical phenomenon explainable? Obviously, yes. Is Darcy's law explainable? Yes. Is diffusivity equation and fluid fluid, is it explainable? Yes. No doubt about it. How the results are explained? Well. In the traditional model, you develop, you use a mathematical equation. You solve the mathematical equation, and you can explain it by creating curves, right? You can do perform single parameter sensitivity analysis. You can do multiple parameter sensitivity analysis. You can do type curves. 
So it's explainable, conventional. Question, is PDA explainable? Yes, how? You can do the same thing. You can do single parameter sense three tenants, multiple parameter sense three tenants, and you can develop type curves. I'm gonna show you very, very quickly. Uh, this one, it's a single parameter. This is what we did for uh, uh, shale. If this is the model we developed purely based on data, if you then you for a given well, you plot prosody versus production for that particular well, and you sweep through pro porosity from beginning to the end, you see that production increases. Does that explain it? Does that make sense? Yes. You go to another well, you go to another well. How about if you do stimulated lateral length versus production? Yes. So let me show you one last thing about before I finish, and that would be The type curves. You all are familiar with type curves, right? These are type curves, and these type curves are what we do in our technology, in our industry. All of them are based on equation, and they are very well behaved. Why? Because they generated by equation, right? And equation was used to model the physics. So explaining the influence of lateral length and propane concentration on hydrocarbon production with different wells in Marcellus Shale. It tells you that if you plot, if you plot stimulated lateral length on X axis and production of, a, of the well on Y axis, and every curve shows you the propane concentration, you can see low propane concentration to high propane concentration that changes. Question, is it well behaved? It's obvious it's well behaved, right? Was an equation to generate that? No, it was purely based on measured data. No equation whatsoever. Look at this one. This is on the x-axis you have lateral length. Sorry, on the x-axis you have lateral length, on the y-axis you have the cum production of a well. And each curve shows number of stages used in shale analytics. This is for one of the wells. Is it well behaved? This is for another well in the same asset. Is it well behaved? Is this well behaved? This is lateral length versus uh, production, but every curve shows you prop amount of propane per stage. You can see how well behaved they are, correct? Was it an equation used to build them? No, it was purely based on data. So it is explainable. It's 12 p.m., end of the hour, I'm going to stop and answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much for your attention. Great. Thank you very much, Shahab, for the nice and very interesting presentation. Uh, before the starting Q&A session, I'm very glad to announce that Shahab teaches the class in this topic in PetroTeach. Yes. Could you please go to the next slide, Shahab, or maybe this one? Uh, the last slide. Uh, this one? Um, let me. Okay, so keyboard and mouse control request. So if yes, I guess. Please give me. Yes, I, I just did it. Okay. Yes, the course will be offered in 5 and 6 of May 2021 for two days, half day each. Here you can see some details of the class, which will be offered online and also in-house for your company in a private class. The course includes high level coverage of technical foundations of artificial intelligence and machine learning and its application in petroleum engineering. So please note that uh, places are limited and will have, uh, will be allocated on a first come first serve basis. For more information, kindly visit our website or send email to register at petroteach.com. So, Let's go for Q&A.